Today, as you listen to this teaching by Pastors Ralph and Joanne Hone, we hope you'll enjoy it and learn some practical ways to walk into the awesome life God has for you. For more information and for more free teaching, visit our website, www.tapintothesource.com. So we are finishing, or not finishing, we're in the third week of our series, Getting the Hell Out. How many people like being in hell? See, nobody's hands get raised. Everybody wants to get out of hell. I like that country song, if you're going through hell, keep on going. Don't slow down. You know, I tell people, when you're going through hell, pedal to the middle all the way, baby. Blow out that other side so when you come out, the devil say, I thought we were going to contain them. You know, and God, we got to realize God is a good God for us. We talked about this over the last couple of weeks. If you have missed week one and week two, go on the app or go on uh, to tap into the source.com or website and just pull those up and listen to them. I know that God's got something in there for you. We're going to kind of continue on in this series and, and, and continue just to talk about how good God is and what he has for our lives and how do we apply this into our lives. Do you know what? God never set you up to just survive, but he set you up to thrive. And I think too often we are setting settling for survival mode. We're settling to get that miracle finally. It was like, oh, I was so desperate and, and God answered my need. And whew, I can live through today. I can get through till tomorrow. But you know, God never ever planned for us to stay in survival mode. Okay, survival is good. How many of you know survival is good? But thriving is so much better. And the thing is that so often we are stuck in survival mode because we just haven't shifted into God's kingdom, into his system. We talked last week in, ex in extensive um, ways about having to shift from the world's way of doing things or the world's system into God's system or God's way of doing things. And that takes time. It takes learning what he has to say about all those different areas of our life. But the thing is, that's where all, it's in God's system. As we said, we had the world system over here, and we had God's system over here. And you kind of can't put one foot in each. I don't know, maybe you can do the splits. I can't do the splits. Okay, but you can't have a foot in each. It has to be one or the other. But when we're in here, in God's system, it doesn't mean that we won't have trouble. Man, I wish I could tell you that. Guess what? You accept Jesus. You live for God. You're never going to have a moment of trouble. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay. Someday when we're in heaven, that's what we get. So that is our eternal reward. Praise God. But till then, we're going to go through issues. But the thing is that when we're in God's system, when we're doing it his way, we can have peace in the storm. We can have joy in the storm. We know that God is with us and that he is the one who will get us through, right? Because we don't want to camp out in the middle of hell. We want to get through it. And when we do it his way, as I said, it's not like a magic wand where our problems go away, but all of a sudden he gives us the ability to handle it. Our perspective of it changes. Psalm 23, 4. We all know the Psalm 23 uh, uh, chapter because it's quoted often, but look at verse 4. It says, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your stuff, staff, protect and comfort me. Now notice this. It says, even when I walk through. Sometimes you're going to walk through some stuff. It's going to be dark. It's going to be difficult. You find out close, somebody close to you has just become very, very ill and they're about to pass away. All of a sudden you find out that your marriage you thought was going well has shifted and it's not going so well anymore. All of a sudden the person that you thought was your really good friend has turned on you. All of a sudden you got word because you got friends in other countries that don't have as much peace and all of a sudden all hell's broken loose and the village got destroyed. All of a sudden you heard bad news that a tornado went through, an earthquake just went through. I don't know about you, but if you look around the world today, I think Italy now has had three earthquakes in the last week. Over six on the scale, which is huge. There's some bad stuff going on. It doesn't say that stuff's not going to go, but it says even though you walk through it, you won't be afraid. 
You know, there's something about God that he says, I'll make you more than an overcomer, but not only that, I won't even have you coated with fear. I want you, you can walk through this thing in, in, in complete peace. Have you ever seen people that have gone through hell and they're still in peace? They almost baffle your mind, and here's what people think. I don't think they really caught on to what's really going on. Come on, somebody. The shock hasn't hit them yet. Have you heard stuff like that? I don't think they're living in a real world. I think they're a little bit in denial here, what's going on in their life. I still remember when my father-in-law dropped dead instantly, and I was in, in town when it happened. And I watched my mother-in-law, and there was a supernatural peace that came on that woman that didn't make any sense, that surpassed all understanding, that put a guard on her heart and mind, and she stayed in perfect peace. Married 55 years, and all of a sudden, bam, your husband's gone. Your spouse is gone. What What just happened here? And yet, all of a sudden, there was this cloak of peace. Didn't say they weren't going to go through some difficult stuff. Come on, somebody. Some of you are in the middle of going through some difficult stuff right now. I want you to know that God wants to give you his peace so that you don't have to be afraid what you're going on. Because some of you are saying, but if you only knew what the court system was going to do, if you only knew what this was going to happen or what that was going to happen or somebody got some bad stuff on me or whatever, whatever, whatever. The Bible says you might go through it, but he says, I want you to not be afraid. I want you to have complete peace. There's something that God gives his kids, that supernatural peace, that we need to receive it and say, I need that in my life. I can't do this on my own. I need his peace filling me. Do you know, I still remember um, a really good friend of ours. Uh, Her husband had been having numerous affairs and everything else, and they were going through a divorce. And I still remember standing with her as she's trying to collect her things out of the home and him taking things and smashing them out on the driveway. Everything she owned, he just kept destroying. And I remember us feeling like, ah, let's do, you know, let's show him what he's doing. And she just kept going, no, it's okay. God's got me. God is so much bigger than this. And she had such a calm and such a peace, and God has honored her through it. But that kind of calm and that kind of peace within the midst of the storm only comes when we are obedient to step into his, his kingdom, when we start trusting him at a new level. When we trust him, we'll realize he has good things for us. He's not out to, God's not out to get us. He's out to protect us. And that in the midst of the storm, you don't have to be afraid. That in the midst of the storm, you can still have peace. Now, last week, we talked about moving from our natural way of thinking into God's way of thinking. And it's not always easy. How many of you know it would be great if God just reprogrammed our minds and it was just in a moment? No, it has to be a process. It's a lifelong process for all of us to learn more and more. The good news is that we don't have to do it alone, that it is the grace of God that comes in to give us the power to do it. How many of you know how awesome is that? That God not just, he doesn't just ask us to live a certain way, but he gives us the power to do it, right? It's an amazing. So we want to talk a little bit about grace today because there's two aspects of grace, and the church has kind of, I think, missed one. Some of grace has been mistaught, um, but we want to delve into what are the two sides of grace. First of all, the definition of grace is unearned. Say unearned. Unearned. Undeserved. Undeserved. Favor and spiritual blessing. Favor and spiritual blessing. So can we earn or deserve grace? No, because of something that is unearned (laughs) and undeserved by its very name is means we can't earn it. That means there's nothing we can do that makes us worthy of grace. There's nothing we can do that will earn it. There's no amount of systems. There's no amount of rituals. There's no, you know, 12 steps to grace. Grace is something that is ours. It's undeserved. It's unearned. it's unmerited on our part. It's simply a gift from God. But I Ro- want us to look at something. Romans three twenty four. It says, all, everybody say all. all. Not some, but all are justified and made upright and in right standing with God, freely and gratuitously by his grace, in brackets his unmerited favor and mercy, through the redemption which is provided in Christ. Now, I want you to get an understanding of this. Because we, we've taken this for granted. We don't understand it. Before Jesus 
came to the earth, the priest would have to get up once a year in the temple and go make a sacrifice on behalf of all the people. And if he messed up, he died. So he had to come in this holy reverence. There was a whole protocol that he would have to follow. They would even have bells tied on the bottom of his robe, and he would go in there and do the sacrifices once a year, and he would go on behalf of man. And so what happened when Jesus came, he changed it, and then he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Well, what he did was the, the temple veil that used to keep the holy of holies separated from the people because if they got close to it, it would kill them. Jesus ripped it open and exposed God himself to people directly. No more go between. No more having to call the priest or the pastor, the rabbi, the bishop, whatever. You could have direct access to God yourself. Now, how do you get there? Because we're sinful people. We've got some issues, and all of us do. Some of us are a little dysfunctional. Some of us are still working on some anger issues. Some of us are still working on wanting to, you know, to get back at people. Come on. You, we're all working on areas of our lives that we haven't got completed in. We still have bad thoughts. So how could a holy God who couldn't have anything to do with sin now associate himself with us? Because Jesus came in and he took his blood and the Bible says when we ask for forgiveness, that blood literally comes and just washes all of our sins clean. So the father looks at us and he sees his, his beautiful child. Wow, he looks at you in the morning, wow, come and spend some time with me. We're going to have a good time. He's about relationship. He's about getting to know you. Maybe the other way around, you getting to know him. Since you were made in his likeness and his image, be good to know what that's all about and what he's got planned for your life. So notice how God now has got direct access with you and I. How could he have done that? Because Jesus stepped in. Your big brother, if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, he is your big brother. He stepped in. He said, listen, God, I picked up the tab for them all. Bring them in. By the way, the VIP door is this way. Come this way. Come this way. Come this way. So here's Jesus waving to him. I, I, if you know people, they're going to get you into places. How many people have ever been to the White House and have hung out with the president? I was, oh, I got one hand back there, but I don't think he's telling the truth <laughs> since it's my son. <laughs> How come your hands aren't up? Because you got to know people that know people that can get you connection. If you don't have that connection, you're not going to get in. Because everybody would like to be there and check it out. But if you don't have a connection, Jesus just VIP'd you right in to direct access with his daddy. Well, another great example is, you know, we had Dog the Bounty Hunter here a few weeks ago. Now, they received thousands of requests from people. Thousands of requests. Now, had, had we wanted to meet them, we could have sent in a letter or sent in a request, but what would have happened is it would have gotten lost in the thousands of other requests. There's nothing really to help us step above all of the, the stuff or the other people. No way to bring favor to us. But because of Tim's story, who knew us, we knew a connecting point. He connected us, and guess what? We got to rise into a place of favor with them, they came. We've got a great relationship. They wanna, you know, they're telling us they're coming back now. But what helps you muddle through the thousands of the, the stuff where God is far away from you, where God is vague, where you don't feel like you've got favor, where you, you're having a hard time for your life standing above the rest of the people around you? That comes through Jesus Christ. Suddenly, he, as he said, he puts you into that VIP line. Now, suddenly, you have favor that goes above everybody else. It doesn't seem fair. Well, how come you seem to keep getting free things? How come you always win the door prize when you go someplace, right? <laughs> how come you always seem to get that extra edge? Or how come you always seem to meet just the right person at the right time in the right place? How does that happen? That's because Jesus has connected you into a place of unearned and undeserved favor. That's what grace does, is it connects you into that place of ultimate relationship. 
you know, um, really, God has bring in, brought us um, the aspect of grace that puts us into a place with God is that it brings us forgiveness of sins, which is fabulous. How many of you are glad that he forgives? <laughs> I know sometimes we have a harder time forgiving ourselves, but yet the Bible says that when we ask for forgiveness, he comes and forgives, and he actually removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. How many of you know east and west, it just is a, it keeps going? So that's how far our sin is removed, that beautiful thing of forgiveness. And that is because of grace, because Jesus paid the price for our sin. His blood covered it all. He was that one sacrifice for us. And that's what makes grace so incredibly beautiful. But I want us to really understand that because um, I think for me growing up, I didn't understand fully grace. I understood that God loved me, but I was always scared if I stepped out of line even once. Man, I'm going to go to hell, you know? So it's that constant all day long. Oh, dear Jesus, you know, help me. Dear Jesus, forgive me. Dear Jesus, forgive me. And I didn't even know what I did wrong. I just wanted to make sure all my bases are covered. <laughs> right? You're all smiling at me so self-righteously. You, you know, you've been there probably. Right? When we don't have an understanding of grace, we're, there can be a fear of getting kicked out of the family of God if I make up any, mis any mistake. Now, the thing is, like, I, I, I look at um, the situation in my family. In my family, if my children who have our name mess up, do I instantly go to them and go, whoa, you are not a hone anymore. You messed up. You're out of the family until you get your act together and then you can come back in. Do I do that? No, I shouldn't do that. I don't do that. But what I do is they still have my name. They still have, they are still part of my family, but they've messed up and there's some consequences that are going to happen as a result of that. There are some consequences. But the good news is they are still part of our family. Now, should they decide to divorce the family and go off? That's another thing. But God has adopted us. And by adopting us into his family through Jesus Christ, we are in his family. Just because you've messed up today does not mean you're kicked out of the family. We are God. Grace says that we are part of his family. Yes, we're going to make mistakes. Yes, we're going to screw up. But as long as you are still wanting to be part of that family and you are still wanting to serve God, grace will bring that to you. Grace assures you that, guess what? You are a child of God. You are a child of God. Now, it's different if you turn your back on God. That's you divorcing your family and going another direction. You say, I don't want anything to do with God. I'm gone. That's different. But within grace, within our heart to serve God, grace says it's okay. You know what? You messed up yesterday. If the rapture, you know, if you messed up in the morning and the rapture happens at noon and we're all going to heaven, you're going to go to heaven if you're a child of God. Okay? It, God is not so powerless that our mistakes are going to ruin our relationship with him. But what it does do is it, it, it adds consequences where, where we start growing distant from him, where, where things start getting in the way of it. Um, but what, actually, I want to want to say one thing. Many times, um, I think without an understanding of grace, what's going to happen is every Sunday you're going to come to church and get saved all over again. Right? It's like, okay, I want to make sure my bases are covered. <laughs> Jesus, come into my life. Well, you know what? As I said, if, if I adopted a child and they went off and rebelled for a little while and came back, whether it be a day or a year or whatever else, and they came back, do I have to re-adopt them? No. All I have to do is forgive them and bring them back. Okay? When you've accepted Jesus Christ, you are part of the family. And unless you have actually turned your back on God, what you all have to do is come to him and ask for forgiveness. You don't have to say, Jesus, you know, come into my heart again. He's there. You're part of the family. So it's just a mind shift because too often we think we have to get saved over and over and over and over again. You know, I hear the stories about kids go to summer camp and they get saved every single night just to make sure their bases are covered, right? And a lot of us have grown up with that. But we have to have, start having the assurance and the confidence. If we don't start having the confidence of the fact that I have Jesus in my life and I'm saved, we will never step into the next part of grace, which is his power. Okay, so we have to have that confidence that we can ask for forgiveness and he forgives us, but we don't have to keep getting saved over and over again. So what, how does this all work? Because God's not going to put a gun to the back of your head and say, serve me. He's a gentleman. 
He's going to invite you. So what's he trying to do? Have relationship. So what is grace? Grace is an ability to have a direct relationship with Jesus and with, with your heavenly Father God. And he's yearning for relationship because all of what grace is is about relationship. See, you got VIP'd in because of relationship. When you became a Christian, you now became a child of the Most High. And, and because the son of the Most High is your big brother, he said, Psst, over here. So you've got favor because of your relationship, not because you did something right or you went through a program or you did this. You got, God said, because you're mine, I'm going to give this to you. Now, I want you to see the Second Peter 1.3. Because we can sometimes say, well, this looks like it's impossible to do. But look at what it says here. It starts, by his divine power, that's God, has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all, everybody say all, all. of this by coming to know him, relationship. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Now, I want you to see this because this is important for us to understand. It's not because you did something right or you acted right or you did a good deed. It's by his divine power. So there's some power that God's releasing here so that you can live right. See, sometimes we will do some goofy things. And I know this week I had an opportunity to do something really goofy. Somebody got on Facebook and ended up attacking me for something they thought I did. They didn't attack me, they attacked her. I don't know what the heck's that got to do with her? Are you with me? They went ape hangers on my wife. And I'll be honest with you, as the man of the house, I wanted to just put my Christian hat and my pastor hat aside and... <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> Let me tell you what I really think of you. How many people know that the love of God will constrain you? Because why is somebody lashing out like that unless there's something void in their own life and they're hurting? What the grace of God does gives you this power to be able to step back and see the picture from a different perspective and say, my God, this woman really needs some help. This man really needs some help. They really need to get their life right because their life is, if your life is wrong, it doesn't matter how fast you go, it's still wrong. And see, it gives us an opportunity now to realize I, I used to lash out like, I used to say, let me tell you what I really think. And God goes, Pow! remember he's dead. The old man is dead. Leave him there. So now you get to respond like God would respond in love. It's not a natural thing that comes to you unless you know him and you've had relationship with him because the closer I get to God, the more I become like God. Come on, this is getting good. The, clo the, 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 the more I become like God, the more I will respond in love like God. Because a lot of people need to have their heads knocked up against the wall. Are you with me? That's the natural flesh. But God says, I've given you my power. Then he says something else. Everything I have is yours. The Lord, about six months ago, he says, when your kids come to you for something, now listen, I haven't got there yet, and I know some of them might be listening. So this could work against me. Are you with me? The Lord said, every time your kids come to you and ask you for something, tell them that everything you have is theirs. Come on, somebody. Because that's what God did for you and I. Everything that heaven has for you, it's yours. Now think about that. God didn't say, well, I'll just give them a little bit. I hope they make it. He says, everything that heaven has belongs to you. You are my child, an heir, born, adopted into the family. However you got in, you're still an heir. Heirs have rights and privileges. Come on, somebody. 
You might be a little dysfunctional dragging yourself through life. God says he's still an heir. She's still an heir. They're still mine. He's in about relationship. Come and spend some time. By his divine power, he's given us this ability to walk into everything that heaven has for us. Nothing held back. No shortage. No, well, Mel, really, you don't deserve it. You never did deserve it. Come on, somebody. You never qualified for it. You never deserved it. In the middle of your disgust, in the middle of your downtroddenness, God looked at you and says, I love you. I got big plans for your life. Come on, child, get up. Let's go. See, that's the God we serve. And when we start to get that revelation of spending that time with him, you will start to have that compassion on other people. Jesus was moved by compassion. He didn't say, there were times he was exhaustedly tired. He'd step into a situation and these people were so desperate and the Bible says Jesus was moved by compassion. It wasn't by energy. Come on, somebody. They didn't have those bars back then, the energy bars or the six-hour boosters. He was moved by compassion. Do you know one of the things in this verse, as we said, it said, we have received all of this by coming to know him. We have to realize that if we want to access the power of grace, we have to do it through our relationship with Jesus. We have to worship Jesus and not a system. And where the church over the years has gotten really good at is worshiping the system. If you go to church, if you serve, if you give your tithes, if you do this, if you do this, if you do this, you're good. Any of that stuff, which is all good, but to be done without relationship is taking you out of grace. And then we wonder why our lives are crashing. We wonder why I'm doing all the right things. I'm even, I've learned how to use faith. I've learned how to tithe. I've learned how to forgive all of these things. And we do all these principles, but we don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You're not going to experience the power of grace in your life. You're not going to experience that, that power that just goes beyond, that takes you to places you couldn't imagine. You're not going to experience that freedom, that peace in the midst of the storm. That's what actually helped us, compelled us to start the church, was we saw so many people who had missed this aspect of it. They had heard about the principles, but they weren't seeing any power because they hadn't mixed the principles with relationship. Are principles and and the way he does things important? Yes, yes but not void of a relationship with Jesus Christ. The two have to be mixed. So yes, as we're learning things, as we're learning how God wants us to do it, as we're learning to obey him, don't ever stop your relationship with him, learning more about him, talking to him. You know what? You may not have an hour every morning to pray, but you know what you can do is you can get in your car and spend 10 minutes talking to him about what your day is. Make it an ongoing thing. He is a relationship. He's not a ritual. The moment we make it a ritual going, okay, well, I have to do it this way, this way, this way. No, he just wants you. He just wants you talking to him. He just wants you learning about him. He just wants you giving your cares to him. Okay, the moment we make it about the system or the principles, we have lost the power of grace. We have lost it, and we don't want to be in that place. You know, um, the second aspect, so the first aspect of it is the relationship, the forgiveness, which is so awesome. Jesus paid that price. The second part of grace is where most Christians um, have not understood, and that is that it is the power to serve God. It is the power. So I want you to look at a verse, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come to you in abundance. How many of you know abundance is good? Abundance is good, so that you may always and under all circumstances and whatever the need be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. Wow. Okay, guys, this is not survival mode. Can you see that? This is thrive mode. This is where it's not just about getting by. This is about all of your needs being met. This is about 
um, not just your needs, but the needs of those around you, because it's talking about charitable deeds. This is a power that goes beyond what you are capable of in your own way. Okay, that is the other side of grace. It is the power. Now, if you, if you take, I just want to go back and read this verse again, but let's re- replace the word grace with power because it gives you a different perspective. It says, and God is able to make all power come to you in abundance so that you may always and under all circumstances and whatever the need be self-sufficient possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. Okay, I want us to look at a little bit of a different aspect here because one of, grace has been mistaught and it's really rampant right now where we're talking about grace a lot. But unfortunately, people will take grace and they go, oh, it's undeserved favor, it's undeserved. I can just sit here and it's gonna pour all over me. But here, this side of grace actually says that grace is the power, that he will give us the power. So if we have the power, that means there's something we need the power for, right? It doesn't say that grace lets you just sit there and wait for it to arrive. It says we have the power to get out and do something. So what we have to realize is God wants us working with him. There are things he's asking us to do. And you might be trembling in your boots going, I don't know how I'm going to do that. God, how do I step out of that big thing in my life that has dragged me down? He's saying, come on, let's do it together. I'm going to give you the power. But you have to make a decision to step out. See, for me, you know, if you know my story, uh, you couldn't get me to even teach a Bible study in my, in my house. Like, I just, I did not want to speak in front of people. Right? But yet, God said go. (laughs) So we started stepping into that. And he's the one, his grace empowers me to do what I do. And then uh, to travel and do conferences and all that kind of stuff. That's his grace. That's his empowerment. That's not me. You don't want me without his grace. Let me tell you. Okay. (laughs) It's not going to be pretty. His grace is what empowers me. But I had to actually yield to that. It didn't just come on me and sit there doing nothing. I had to be willing to and brave enough to step into it. Too many of us are sitting back and we're not understanding that as God is, you know, you're, you're wondering, where are you, God? Where's the favor in my life? Meanwhile, he's asking you to do something. You've got to be willing to step out and be obedient. Because as you step out in obedience is when the power of grace comes in. All of a sudden, he helps you do things you could have never done. You know, you start opening your mouth and you're saying things you could have never understood. Like, it was like, whoa, where'd that come? Any of you ever experienced that? It's like, where did that come from? Okay, we do that every Sunday. It's like, wow, where did that come from? But that's the power of grace where God is working in you. You're putting your natural with his super and you end up with something supernatural. But that's as we yield to grace. But we have to realize the power of grace is what will help us to live the life we have to. God didn't ask us to live a life without giving us what we needed, right? He equipped us through grace. Now, one of the things, grace is not an excuse to live a life of sin. And this is where the abuses kind of come with this whole grace message. And I've talked to, I, I talked to one guy one time who was a faithful Christian that went to a different church. He says, I love my church. I love God's grace. He says, I can go out every weekend, get liquored up, party it up, womanize up, and all I got to do is show up at church on Sunday Ask God to forgive me, and volunteer, and give some money, and everything's good. And this guy was looking at me seriously, like I'm thinking he was joking. I thought this was humor he was sharing with me, because I'm like, what? You know, I can do whatever I want. Well, let me tell you, God will love you through all of it. Even when you're out getting drunk and womanizing and doing stupid things, he'll still love you. His love's never changed. But if you're out committing adultery, God's still going to love you, but your spouse may have a different opinion. Come on, somebody. Like over my dead body, something like that could come out of their lips. You never know. See, we think that, well, bless God, I can do whatever I want, and God's just going to keep forgiving me, and I'll just use this as my get-out-of-jail card every time I'm in a pinch. Oh, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. But we really have no intention of changing our lives. 
You know, it was interesting. They asked the pastor one time, how many people gave their heart to the Lord in your church? He says, I don't know. I'll tell you in six months. Yeah. Huh? They said, what? He says, I don't count numbers. He says, I want to see what's happened to their lives. Are their lives going to change? Because if you're still where you were before you gave your heart to the Lord, you may not have God get a hold of your life yet and let them start changing it. I don't know about you because God says when he gets a hold of your life, he says the old man will die and a new man or a new person will come to life. And, 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 and all of a sudden you used to be grumpy. You used to snap at everybody and now you, you got peace. And all of a sudden, you used to do this, and you're not doing that anymore. I used to want to go out and do this, but I really don't have a desire for that anymore in my life. What happened? God got a hold of you and started changing your DNA from the world to him. What used to be fun for you to do, you're thinking, that was dumb. Come on, somebody. You're with me. See, we got to step back and realize if God has really got a hold of our lives and we've really made him the Lord of our lives, that means when God says, I need you just to, to look at that again and maybe you need to just forgive those people. You're thinking, I don't really want to forgive them. Come on, because your flesh is saying, forget that. And God says, no, no, this is for your benefit, not theirs. See, as long as you're holding unforgiveness, cancer has a root to grow in your life. That's right. As long as you're, you're holding something against this or as long as you're, you're deciding, I'm just going to mark that down and deal with that later, God says, well, okay, but if you're holding it, then I can't release you either because the Bible says that when we forgive, then God will forgive us, but if we don't, he can't. Oh, my goodness. Come on, somebody. We got to get real with the gospel because it's got power in it, but if we deny that power and say, well, you just live your life however you want, go party it up and do whatever you want, problem is we've denied the gospel. The gospel was power for us to not walk in that anymore, to see our lives change. The greatest thing for me to see happen is your life change over a period of time with nobody telling you, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, because God can do that. It's not my job to do that. Some lady walked in one time, let me tell you about my granddaughter. She's at the door. I said, you don't need to tell me about your granddaughter. No, no, let me just explain everything about my granddaughter. And I said, you don't, ma'am, you don't need to explain everything about my, your granddaughter. I need to give you her history. I said, no, you don't. Come on, I'm stopping her at the door. Why not? I said, well, what if somebody rattled off all your history? Come on, somebody. I don't want my history replaced. One thing I'm going to do is forget what's behind. Thank God she's in church. Let's go ahead from here. You know, we shared earlier that with grace, we can be so grateful that the sacrifice Jesus made covers us and that, you know, we can mess up through the day and we're still, you know, grace covers. But I want to take a verse, Hebrews 10, 26, and read it to you because this is really important for us if we want to walk in all of God's best. It says, Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, There is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. Now, the sacrifice is what Jesus did for us. He he brought grace to us by being a sacrifice for us. So what it's saying here is if we are deliberately choosing sin, we're not under grace anymore. And that's where this, this thing has gone wild with, I can just sin, I can do whatever I want, and I'm covered. Well, you know what? You might make it to heaven, but you are never going to operate in all that God has for you if that's the mindset we have. And I'm not talking about messing up. Every one of us is going to mess up on things until we get to heaven. We are. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to, you know, it's like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. And then all of a sudden something pushes your button and you, you end up mad and angry. And it's like, oh, man, I messed it again. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay, because that, you just go to the Lord, oh, forgive me. I am talking about this like he's talking about, where I am purposely, I get to do all of these things that God says no to. And all I have to do is make sure grace covers it. Where he's saying is there isn't grace for that. In other words, what you are doing is you are choosing to switch off the switch of favor in your life. You are choosing to switch off that switch of power in your life. You might still be a child of God. You might still be in... You still might make heaven. You still may be a Christian. But the thing is, what you're doing is you're switching off the very power that you need in your life by choosing sin. 
And the thing is here, what I like about this one is it says that um, if you continue sinning after you have received the knowledge of the truth. You know, each one of us are in a different way, a journey in our life. It's as God reveals to you that there's something in your life that's sin, that we're now accountable for it. Okay, you're not accountable for everything you don't know yet. You're accountable for what you do know. And then, then we start walking it. We're in a different place than you are. That's why we can't be judging each other. We can't be looking at going, well, why, don't you, why do you have that in your life? Why do you have this? No, we're each in a different place. But as God starts revealing the truth to us, as we start seeing things in our life that he says are sin, we're now accountable and saying, no, let's choose to walk. And you still may mess up. But what is your heart saying? The whole thing is, where is your heart? Is your heart to choose sin or is your heart to say, no, I'm going to choose God. I'm going to choose to walk in grace. I might be struggling with this. You know, and God knows our hearts. He knows that. But the whole thing here is that we're going to step out of the favor of God. We're going to step out of the power of God if we, don't, if, if we continue to deliberately choose sin. He still loves you. So there's a great story in the Bible of a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And they were really trying to set Jesus up. It's interesting, if she was caught in the act of adultery, where was the guy? Yeah. Anyways, forget that. We'll deal with that <laughs> another time. Yeah, she says, let's talk about that. <laughs> Guys get away from a lot of, they get this, the, the clean sweep. The women get the names attached to them. Is that true? Even Nothing's when we don't changed do 2,000 years later. Okay, John Anyways. 8, verse 9 to 11. They listened to him. This is Jesus. And he said, whoever is... Whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. In other words, you're pointing out all of her flaws. How about you? What's wrong in your life? Okay? So he's saying, the first, whoever doesn't have any sin, you can be the one to throw the first stone. So they listened to him, and they began going out, conscience-stricken, one by one, from the oldest down to the last one of them, till Jesus was left alone, with the woman standing there before him in the center of the court. When Jesus raised himself up, he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? She answered, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Now, he was the one without sin. If anyone could have condemned her, it would have been him. But he says, I do not condemn you. Go on your way. And from now on, sin no more. Now, was he trying to be legalistic with her? Was he trying to take anything away from her by saying sin no more? No. What he was trying to do was realize, hey, woman, you have a second chance. My mercy, my grace has now empowered you to walk away. Okay, you have been pardoned. But don't go doing the same thing because what's going to happen if you go do the same thing again? You're going to end up back here in this exact same place. I might not be here next time to stop the stoning. So understand, when God is asking us to let go of sin, he's not doing it to try and take something great away from you. He's trying to protect you from the consequence that's going to come. He's trying to protect you from the destruction that it brings in your life. You see, every time we sin, we may still be, as I said, when we, when we choose sin in our life, we may still be a child of God. But what happens is every time we sin, it starts severing. If there's no grace, grace is what relationally connects us, connects us to God, right? So every time we choose sin, we're just sort of chipping away at that connection to God. And our, our distance from him starts growing more and more and more and more. And you know, some of you here in this church have estranged relationships with children where you haven't had the relationship you want. You still love them. They're still your child, but you're not intimate like you would like. That's like God. He's, his heart is breaking because we're getting farther and farther and farther away from him because sin bridges, the, makes this chasm between us. And he's saying, I don't want to be estranged. I want to be intimate. Just, just come on. I'll give you the power to do it. I'll give you the power to live free from this sin. That's the beauty of grace. It's not just that he covers our sin, but it's that he gives us the power to live without the sin. How amazing is that? It is the power that will step you into your destiny. It's the power that will help you overcome the fear that's holding you back. God's, asked, God's put a big dream on your heart and you're fearful. It's his grace that's going to step in. As we start obeying him, as we start letting things go, all of a sudden your, his power will start rising up in you. Things will start coming out of you that you didn't even know were in you. Yeah. That's because of his grace. You know, um, Pastor Joanne shared a story from one of the ladies that came to the uh, SHE conference in Winnipeg. 
And she said she's really hungry for God. And she was just so parched. And she showed up and she says, I, was, I just got filled. A few days after, she went back to her home church and she says, I was on fire, just excited about it. And he says, she said, but everybody around me wasn't. She says, they used to be. They weren't anymore. They mocked her and they called her names and they, they, they put her to the side. Don't worry, all this will wear off. See, what she did was she got in and just renewed herself and her spirit with God. And God started just developing and pulling that relationship back. So that means if, if, if we have pulled away from God, God says, listen, let me just bring this relationship back to where originally it was intended to be. Walk towards me. That means making decisions. God, I'm just going to do what I can. You know, and, and, and whether you can spend an hour a, a day with God or you can spend 15 minutes, spend some time with him. Tell him where you're at. Tell him what you're going through. Share your heart with him. Why? Because he cares. The Bible says that he still heals the brokenhearted. Somebody's heart's getting healed today. That's what the Lord just said to me. He still will set captives free. Some of you have been in captivity. What do I mean? Not physically where you're chained up, but the devil's had you chained up and kept you addicted to certain things and you need to break free and you've been thinking, I've tried everything I know what to do. God says, I'll just release that. I'll give you my power to do it. So I want us to pray here. I'm going to ask everybody to pray because I don't want to embarrass anybody. You're online. You're in the Winnipeg campus. You're here in this campus. There's a prayer that sets that right with God, and that's asking Jesus into your life. And I want to pray that prayer, and I'm going to ask everybody to repeat it after me. Say it out loud. Believe it. If you're online, I don't care who's in the room with you. Speak it out loud. Watch what God starts to do. Pray this with me. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. Forgive me. Forgive me. I've messed up. I've messed up. Jesus, Jesus. I need you more than ever. I need you more than ever. In my life now. In my life. Fill my life. Fill my life. Help me to live for you. Help me to live for you. Every day of my life. Every day of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. For more free teaching and information about The Source, please go to www.tapintothesource.com.